Coming up, Boeing shows us their Starliner. Firefly shows us their engine. And SpaceX shows us their inside of the Crew Dragon. Plus, we're going to talk about our no acronym policy and why maybe you should adopt it too. Stay tuned. Tomorrow begins right now. And welcome to tomorrow, episode 8.26 for Saturday, September 12th, 2015. My name is Benjamin Higginbotham. With me, as always, the beautiful, lovely, wonderful, and talented Carrie Ann Higginbotham will be joined by Space Mike a little bit later on. But before we get there, let's thank the patrons of tomorrow who have helped to make this specific segment of this episode happen. These are the people who have contributed at least $10 to this specific episode. And we are a crowdfunded show, so every single dollar helps. To find out more information on how we crowdfund these shows, head on over to patreon.com slash tmro. You'll notice that list has gotten a little bit longer, so thank you and welcome to all of our new patrons. Also, uh, we haven't actually posted this on the Patreon page yet, but we have actually increased the number of things that we are giving our premiere members, so they now have access to our Slack channel, uh, which we'll show you in the, uh, in the main topic area. So, all right, let's go ahead and get started with some space news. First off, earlier today, uh, September 12th at 1540 Coordinated Universal Time, China had a secret military launch. Now, we don't have footage as per usual, but we do have some pictures, so here we go. Uh, I think the, so, neat picture, you can kind of see it, uh, uh, the vehicle on the left-hand side, but the most interesting thing I took away out of this was um, they're using Windows XP. I found that to be uh, somewhat interesting, a uh, operating system that no longer has any support, and that's what they're launching. So, there you can see the vehicle lifting off the pad right there. And one, I think there's one more, isn't there? Yeah, there you go. I lo really like that shot. Mm -hmm. I think that's a that's a brilliant, beautiful shot. Are there any more data? Is that that's the last one? All right, cool. So there you go. Like I said, it was a military payload. I think they gave the normal like, hey, something, something weather. It's not where it's going. So off you go. So all right. Speaking of launch. Uh, yeah, Soyuz launch of Galileo satellites, uh, part of the Galileo constellation, I suppose. Uh, at one uh, zero, f I can't talk apparently. <sighs> at 556 UTC, I changed it to UTC instead of GMT because I did still copy and paste it. <laughs> or 156 AM EDT, Friday, September 11th. Thank you. Uh -huh. I, I, do, I do appreciate that. We'll uh, talk. Uh, there's a comment in the third part of yep. the show. From, yeah, go ahead. There you go. Yeah. <laughs> I have to roll these at T minus 11 seconds. Yeah. I normally do T minus 3, yeah. but it takes so Two. long. Yeah. Stop. And decollage There you go. I still think they say something about decotage and or dig anyway. Uh, from the French Guiana Space Center, in case you couldn't figure that part out with the counting, uh, they launched two identical satellites nicknamed Alba and Oriana, uh, which are numbers nine and ten out of what will eventually be a constellation of thirty by twenty twenty. Uh, that would be 24 operational birds and six spares, as they like to say. This is Europe's Galileo constellation of satellites for reliable GPS across all of the European nations. Yep, it's their, basically the, uh, their version of GPS for yep. the world. So I think there, there are, how many GPS systems are there now? There are like four unique GPS systems, something like that? I don't know. Like well, this is an interesting yeah. constellation. It's going to be on like three separate planes, you know, just all over the place. And it should be really interesting. Some really interesting news that came out this last week. We're going to head over to Space Mike because this is kind of awesome. Talking about Aerojet, Rocketdyne, and United Launch Alliance. Space Mike, what's going on in that airspace? So Aerojet, Rocketdyne has made a really interesting bid to purchase United Launch Alliance for $2 billion in cold, hard cash. And this is really interesting because United Launch Alliance, of course, is a joint venture between Lockheed Martin and Boeing. Lockheed Martin is saying, heck yeah, show me the money. And Boeing is saying, whoa, 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 wait a minute. We have a pretty uh, long-standing vested interest in space for the next several years. We don't want to sell it over to Aerojet Rocketdyne right now. So there's a disagreement there between the two partners who currently own United Launch Alliance. 
And with this whole thing, this would be a very interesting play if the company does end up being sold to Aerojet Rocketdyne to ensure that Aerojet's new engine, the AR-1, to replace the RD-180 uh, engines that we're getting from Russia would be the next engine to be used on the Vulcan rocket, which United Launch Alliance is planning to build. So that, that would be a very interesting thing, but as of right now, until Boeing and Lockheed Martin can make on some sort of agreement as to whether to sell the company or not, we're just going to have to wait and see what happens from there. But personally, there's a lot of different stuff that Aerojet Rocketdyne is doing, and if this were to come to pass and Aerojet would acquire the company, I might be okay with that. So. Anyway, that is what is going on with this whole thing, and we're just going to have to wait and see what the developments come from this. But from here, uh, there is some new uh, engines and, and new crew vehicles that are being developed, and so I want to pass it back over to you, Ben, and talk about what Boeing is working on currently. I'm going to pass it back. Actually, uh, before we go into that, I have, uh, and you may not be able to answer either one of these, but two questions I had. One, it doesn't feel like $2 billion is enough. For United Launch Alliance, it feels like it's a really small number. What what say you? I agree. I think that that is a really small number. I mean, Atlas V launches by themselves are anywhere between two hundred and fifty to four hundred and fifty million dollars per launch, and I'm not exactly sure how much of that is a profit that United Launch Alliance is making, but. I mean, considering how many launches that they have, I mean, United Launch Alliance, you know, over the past couple of years has been doing anywhere between 8 to 15 launches per year. So I feel like $2 billion is what they would make in like a, I don't know, I'm guessing as a two to three year period of, of profits. So I do not think that that is enough money. But the fact that it is in cash instead of some sort of other, you know, shady deal to, to carry over profits to eventually pay for this thing. You know, there's all sorts of complicated economics there when companies merge and are bought out that I don't fully understand. But that whole offer of here's cash, we have it now, I think that that's what's so tempting, especially to Lockheed Martin. So and what's your other question? My, my second part is United Launch Alliance doesn't build any rockets. That's the interesting part here. Boeing builds rockets, Lockheed Martin builds rockets, but United Launch Alliance, they're just basically the guys who fly the rockets. So if Aerojet Rocketdyne is buying United Launch Alliance. That still means, I assume, that Boeing and Lockheed are building the rockets? How does... How, how in the world is that relationship actually going to work? I... I would assume that United Launch Alliance does have some power as to what contracts they are, are going to fulfill. And also, especially for the Vulcan rocket, it seems like United Launch Alliance is taking the lead on designing what that is going to be. And I don't fully understand what the partnership is going to be between Lockheed and Boeing to build the Vulcan rocket. But since they're making a lot of the decisions on this, by Aerojet acquiring them, that would give Aerojet the power to make a lot of decisions for their future, future rockets. Um, whether or not Boeing and Lockheed would still continue that or whether Aerojet would try to somehow acquire the licenses and patents to start manufacturing those rockets, and that would be a whole other slew. They would need to pretty much buy the factories from Boeing and Lockheed as well. So there's a lot into that, and if, if Aerojet just wants the, the power to be able to make some decisions so that their company is manufacturing parts for future rockets, then that might be all that this is. So. Uh, and the That's final, as much as I can make out of it. The final note I should point out is that this is all stemming from a Wall Street Journal article, and basically all other people talking about this and all sources point back to that original Wall Street Journal article. There's always a possibility that the original Wall Street Journal article is wrong. United Launch Alliance isn't saying anything. Boeing's not saying anything. Lockheed Martin's not saying anything. It does smell accurate because of them not saying anything. Uh, normally they would be like, no. Uh, so it's it feels kind of like there's some negotiation going on, uh, but we also have like no real details as to you know two billion in cash and maybe there's something else or who's gonna do the I mean there's a lot of details we're missing here, but really really interesting uh, a rumor going around uh, regardless. So thank you, Micah. That that's we'll keep following that as we get m more additional information. Now speaking of Boeing, that's my segue. Uh, they, uh, they announced uh, this, this last couple weeks that the CST-100, which is their crew capsule that they're building for NASA to send crews to the International Space Station, station is going to be named Starliner. Now this, okay, no, do that again, Mike. Do it again. Do it again. 
There you go. All right. Uh, now, I like the name <laughs> because Boeing also has the Dreamliner airplane, so it's kind of a, uh, a little bit of a theme that they've got within the company. The Dreamliner airplane, the Starliner uh, space taxi. Yeah. Craft star, star, star liner, star liner, star <laughs> liner. Uh, so that's pretty cool. Uh, now they're going to be building this in orbital processing facility three, which they took over from the space shuttle program in October of 2011. Uh, they've actually even painted it. Uh, so this is what it looks like now. They actually, yeah, they began working on that's this in cool. September of 2012. They're removing all the old shuttle gear. So all those, actually, you can even see in the door like that little nook that was. Go back, go back, go back. That little nook. In the middle, we're an internet show, I can do that. In the middle, that's where the, the uh, tail would come out. Mm -hmm. uh, yeah, they actually had to, to open that up. So anyhow, uh, they've renamed that. Uh, the, so Orbital Processing Facility 3 was easy. Now they're calling it Commercial Crew and Cargo Processing Facility, or th C3PF. Yep, that's its new name. So like I said, Orbital Processing Facility 3, uh, that's where the CST-100 Starliner, it's full name, by the way, you can go forward now. Full name is CST-100. 100 Starliner. It's not just the Starliner. Now, in addition, so they got OPF, the Orbital Processing Facility 3. Uh, they've got this shiny new name for the Starliner. Awesome. That's really cool. But they're also working on the crew tower for Space Launch Complex 41. And that's what that other picture is. That's right there. This is, they're building this outside, about four miles away from the launch pad. They're building this in pieces. Then they're bringing it over to Space Launch Complex 41 and assembling it. The reason they're doing that is because Space Launch Complex 41 is an active launch pad and they're actively flying Atlas rockets out of there and they don't want to interfere with the workflow of the rockets. So they build these, put that together, that's the crew tower, boom, there you go. That is your Starliner, ladies and gentlemen. So beautiful spaceship, beautiful modern spaceship uh, being put together. Also lens flare in the picture. Well, yeah, because J.J. Mm -hmm. Abrams ruined space for everyone now. <laughs> Speaking of beautiful spaceships, <laughs> how about a brand new engine? That's my segue. Oh, wait, no, you know, that's a terrible segue. Mike, can you segue from Boeing to... From yeah, Boeing well, to you said, speaking of beautiful spaceships, and we were just talking about J.J. Abrams, you could just as easily then continue on with Firefly and Serenity. Shiny. So what's your segue? What's your segue? Then? Shiny. Shine. Your segue is shiny? No, what? no, but I mean, if you have to explain it, it's not a good segue anymore, Speaking of it? Firefly. Oh, speaking, speaking of lens flares, here's some really bright lights. There you go. Okay. Thank you. We'll, we'll take that one. That'll work. Firefly Space Systems had a test a test engine. I can't talk. Has it? They've tested one of their I believe engines. in you. You can do it. You can uh, get through this show. Go to the picture. Thank you. You can do this. Now I can read things. <laughs> uh, this happened in Cedar Park, Texas on September 10th of 2015. It was a successful test firing of their Firefly Rocket Engine Research 1, or F-R-E-R-1, -E because that's super easy to say, too. Oh, goodness. Okay, so this is uh, this is the engine that they're going to use on their two-stage small satellite launcher, which they're calling Firefly Alpha. It's going to be powered by uh, the FRE engines. The first stage will be by FRE2, which is actually an array of 12, and then the upper stage with a single FRE1, if that made any sense to anybody, because it took me like 18 <laughs> times to read it to understand it. Uh, so this is the first hot fire test of the FRER1. I hate that term so much. And the first hot fire test Ugh. of the FRE2 aerospike engine is expected to take place in early 2016. Everyone understand that? It's a test fire or a static fire. It's not anyhow. Yep. Sure. Anyway, uh, the nice thing is, actually, if you, if, Dad, if you wouldn't mind going back to the other picture really quickly. <laughs> I know. I'm now really you're sorry. doing it to him. I'm really sorry. <laughs> uh, ben Brockert, also known as Wicket on uh, on Twitter, said that one of the couple things you can actually tell from this picture is that T-Teb ignition or, or a copper chamber is burning and that it's aggressively film cooled. Uh, T-Teb is T-E-A slash T-E-B. I ironically an acronym I'm using in the show and I don't know what how uh, to it's it all triethyl aluminum triethyl boring 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 if and I then you right. can tell that because of the green see at the very end of the tail you can see some like green sort of flame uh, typically that would point to as Wicked is saying uh, t tab ignition or the copper chamber is burning by the way I, I get really like one space geek point for knowing t tab I'm for the most part right off the top of yes, my head that's why I turned to you 
for that one. <laughs> but no one got to see that. Okay. Uh, so the other pictures were, uh, <laughs> that is their control room, like the little control thing. So if you're ever thinking like these are a big, huge space age buildings, it's just a shack. And then the other picture, if I remember right, that's kind of an overview, right? You can see the shack in yeah, the that's, uh, upper that's left their corner. Campus, they, yeah, everyone. that's the campus, exactly. And they're in Texas. Texas, right? Cedar yeah, Park, they're Texas. In, they're in Texas. So yeah. kind of the cool place to be. Uh, let's head that back over to Space Mike. Speaking of cool things. Yes. Okay. We have some very cool things. First of all, SpaceX has released some very awesome footage, and let's watch that. Hawthorne, this is Dragon. Falcon has placed us in orbit, and trajectory looks good. Copy that. We see the same. Time to next Delta V is one hour. So this is actual real footage of the interior of this Crew Dragon capsule that I believe is going to be flying into space. And it looks so much better than when they unveiled the Dragon V2, and now known as Crew Dragon. And the, the controls look legitimate, that looks like real space controls right there. Everything is carbon fiber on the inside and just it looks amazing. I would definitely love to ride in this vehicle. Even just to be inside of it if I don't go to, sp go to space inside of it, but this vehicle is awesome. In the past, SpaceX has said that the vehicle will be able to carry anywhere from four to seven crew members into space. However, I only count six seats in this video, so I'm not exactly sure what the plan is for that. However, as far as ISS mission planners are concerned, the demonstration mission is only going to have two astronauts on board for the first one, and then we'll have four astronauts on board for regular commercial crew flights. They have apparently stated that we want to have more of the interior volume with more cargo, so there's... I. As far as I know, there are different options to be able to increase the crew size anywhere from four to seven, depending on the needs and the destination. Let's not forget that someday Boeing might have this, their inflatable space stations up. Excuse me, Bigelow would have their inflatable space stations up, and Dragon would be able to also go to those places. So, very cool. I'm very happy to see this footage and the progress that SpaceX is making, and they're getting ever closer to be able to launching the Crew Dragon for the first time. So. Very excited that and very happy about uh, this, this progress. But speaking of progress, I want to pass it back over to Ben about a lot of new information we've been getting. That would have been awesome if there was a progress launch. That would have been like the perfect segue for progress <laughs> launch. Also, Mini Stowe is called Shotgun. So uh, I believe she gets to sit at the first. She gets to sit uh, next to the pilot. Uh, does that, make, that would make her the commander. Oh, well played, Mini Stoge. Well, well played. All right, yeah. So New Horizons, that is a spacecraft that is uh, flown pla past Pluto. Took some amazing imagery. Took a bunch of uh, uh, science readouts from the planet or not planet, whatever, the Plutoid, Thank whatever you. we want to call it. And um, it get, basically what happened is the, the spacecraft turned away from Earth and pointed at the celestial object and kind of took all of its measurements and readings and then it spun back around and pointed its antennas back at Earth so that it could start transmitting. Well, we got a, a bunch of the initial data, but we only got like 5% of it or so. So we're still missing about 95% of that data. It's a, tens of gigs of data that we're missing. And so it has started to transmit that data back as of Saturday, September 5th. <laughs> it's going to take about a year to complete transmitting all of that data. The three billion miles away from Earth that New Horizons is currently located. Uh, now, for those of you in the U.S., I know that you like to uh, uh, liken that to football field. So that is 44 billion, uh, uh, 11,733 football fields away from, from Earth. I, you did that I did that math. <laughs> uh, now, the reason it's going to take so long to transfer uh, 10 gigs, uh, what is it, uh, 10 gigs of data, tens yeah. of gigabytes of data. So we'll call that like 20 gigs. The reason it's going to take a year to transfer 20 gigs is transfer rates 1.4 kilobits per second. It's going through NASA's Deep Space Network or DSN. These are some of the pictures that we got. Already, you can see kind of like mountains and just 
geology on Gorgeous. Pluto, which makes me say it's more of a planet than it is a Plutoid. But of course, I'm not paid the big bucks to make that classic determination. Although, what defines a planet? It's whatever you decide defines a planet. So if we decide that this is a planet, then there you go. Look, these images are just absolutely gorgeous. Stunning. So uh, there you go. So New Horizons getting a ton of new data. 95% of its remaining data is being downlinked from New Horizons right now. All right, so we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back, we're going to be talking about our no acronym policy. Now, that might seem like a boring topic, but it's actually something that gets people fired up <laughs> and very passionate about using using acronyms or not using acronyms, why you should or shouldn't, why we have our policy and why we think uh, it's good for the entire space industry. So stay tuned. We'll be right back. And welcome back to the show. Now, before we get started with our no acronym policy or no napping policy. No, it is a napping policy. No napping policy. No, it's not a no but napping I said, that's policy. Like, that's like saying no, no acronym yes, policy everyone policy. everyone should be napping. Everyone should be napping. Yes, yeah. everyone yeah, okay. should be napping. Woo, this is why you don't use acronyms. I'd like to thank ah. all of the patrons of tomorrow who've helped to make this specific segment of this episode happen. These are the people who have contributed $5 or more to this specific episode. You can contribute whatever dollar value you feel this is worth. So if you want to contribute as little as a penny, you can do that. You can contribute $5, $10. At each, there are different levels at which we give you different rewards. But at every level, we put your name in the show. And a huge thank you for helping to make this show happen week after week. For more information on how you can help crowdfund the shows, head on over to patreon.com slash T-M-R-O. Now, before we get into our napping policy, so apparently you need to all be napping. Um, actually, Dada, I think there's an image in there called uh, Slack, uh, if you don't mind. So we were talking about patrons. just wanted to point this out. For those of you who are premier patron members, uh, we have opened up a brand new exclusive Slack cha channel just for you. Uh, this is an insight into my crazy brain. Uh, and I'm also allowing some people to actually see, yes, the plants indeed are still alive. You can see in the top picture, as of September 7th, the plants are alive, getting sunlight and sometimes water. <laughs> and uh, uh, yeah, we've actually got um, some of our stuff that we're working on for season 10 in there. Uh, you got the show rundown for this early. There's a bunch of really great stuff that happens. So if you're a premier citizen of tomorrow and you don't have your Slack invite yet, please let me know. Email me, Benjamin at tmro.tv, and we'll make sure that you get access to that uh, if you'd like access to that. Uh, all of our premier members get that. It's just an extra added bonus that we've given to our premier members because I thought it would be cool. All right, so this kind of comes, the concept of no acronyms um, really became popular when Elon sent out his acronyms seriously suck email. More specifically, uh, there was a book written about Elon mm -hmm. and the email was written, uh, was typed out in, in its entirety mm -hmm. in printed in this book of like, this is how Elon communicates. This is the text of that. Now, uh, if you want to read the whole text, pause the video now because we're not going to stay on this for very long. So just pause the video. You can read the whole text or you can actually search for acronyms seriously suck. And then, uh, you know, some of the websites that track what Elon says, uh, they have actually posted it in its entirety as well. So a really long thing in there. But the, the main takeaway is that... Um, Excessive use of made-up acronyms is a significant impediment to communication. And, and that is in part why we have that same policy here, the no acronyms policy. We had that before that was made public or anything else because, on the show at least, it's exceptionally difficult to convey information using just acronyms. Now, that's not to say that all acronyms are bad. For example, NASA. If I say National Aeronautics and Space Administration, a lot of people will have no idea what I'm talking about. But if I say NASA, they'll know exactly what I'm talking about. So there are times when you actually do need to use the acronym, and it is, in fact, better to use the acronym than it is to not use the acronym. And, and people get into this whole, well, if you're never going to use acronyms, then blah, you know, wh where do you draw that line? Because I'm sure there's something, something. You draw the line at communication. If you will understand what I'm saying, if everyone can understand what I'm saying, 
then you can use the acronym. Mm -hmm. If you're not going to understand what I'm saying, if it's not an inclusive conversation, if there's even a chance that you won't have any idea what I'm saying, I need to actually say what the acronym means. That doesn't mean I can never use the acronym. Sometimes I'll spell it out and then use the acronym and say no earlier than net and then I will say net after that because I've explained what no earlier than is, but I have not created a barrier to entry for you. This is super, super important in the aerospace industry. We collectively are all on the same team. <clears throat> SpaceX, Boeing, Lockheed, China, all of us, we want humans to go to space. We want to get humanity excited about going to space. And if we put up these barriers to entry, these useless, silly acronyms, LOL does not mean laughing out loud in space. It means potentially loss of life. It could mean, all these acronyms could mean different things. VTVL, who outside of aerospace is gonna know that that stands for vertical takeoff, vertical landing? Mm -hmm. That's not a normal thing people think of. So by not saying those things, by not using those acronyms, and by making it a policy in your everyday life to not use things that are exclusive and to use inclusive terminology, it will generally help. Now, this was brought up in Reddit as well, and this is actually part of why we're having this discussion because one of the moderators of the slash r slash SpaceX subreddit actually took a little bit of issue, rightfully so. He brings up some very good points. This is Ecologic, and he said, the key takeaway here here is that he stated that he being Elon stated that acronyms that serve no purpose are contrived and suck. He did not say acronyms should never be used, and that is true. And um, I think I won the internet with my example of right yep. right of of why you shouldn't use acronyms by using a Disney example. And do you want to help with the Disney example? Sure. Because I feel like I screw this up every time. So. We're all space geeks, but you guys know we are Disney geeks. So what happens in the Disney community? So the main uh, sort of differentiation, uh, aside from the actual topic that we are all passionate about, is that space geeks in general, we're all excited about space. We all want to see progress happen in space, and we want everyone else to be just as excited as we are. Right? Yes. However, Disney geeks, not all of them, have a tendency to feel as though they're empowered. They spend a lot of money on these things. And if I can spend more money than you, then I should clearly get more privilege than you. And therefore, if I'm talking about something and you don't know what I'm talking about, because I've made a reservation at uh, BOG, for instance, well then that means that I know what I'm talking about and you don't, it means I clearly have more privilege than you and I'm better than you somehow, magically. Which is a really sad way of thinking when you look at it because then I can't get excited about whatever your reservation is for and I can't help you with your reservation and I can't be included in your conversation because I have no idea what BOG stands for. And or should I have any interest in any way, shape or form, I now have to go look it up and figure out what on earth you're talking about. For example, the MNS S. HP. <laughs> yes. M N S S H P. Yes. That is an honest to God Disney acronym that they use. Yes. And it is ridiculously stupid. It's really sad. And they do it the same way that aerospeaks, aerospace geeks do it too. They just pepper it into subjects and into natural speech. And if you don't know it, you know, you it's your responsibility to go look it up. But frankly, you probably aren't. Right, unless you're really actually interested in that exact thing that they're talking about. But there's a difference there that you brought up, is they're not trying to get you excited no. about going to Disney. They don't care if you're excited about going to Disney. But we collectively, as, as the aerospace community, as the communities of tomorrow, as the people who see the future of humanity and the stars, we are trying to get the planet excited about this stuff. And by using these acronyms, we are creating a false barrier to entry that shouldn't exist. Again, not every acronym. If you can communicate with the group you're in, 100% of the group that you're in, without using or with using acronyms, then that's okay, right? It's not. It's not to say you should never ever use an acronym again. It's to understand who your audience is and understand who your potential audience is. And another interesting side of this is that there were even people in the SpaceX thread who had no idea what NET stood for, and they were they had been on the subreddit for two plus years, mm -hmm. had no idea that NET stood no earlier than is what NET stands mm -hmm. for. So when you say a rocket's going to launch net July 17th, it will launch no earlier than July 17th. It could launch later than that, but definitely not before that. Right. So that's what that terminology means. You could just say no earlier than, mm -hmm. or you could just say not before. Mm -hmm. I mean, there are many different ways that you can go about doing this. Acronyms serve 
very little usable purpose in most any industry, including Disney, other than to create exclusivity and privilege. It doesn't actually save you that much time when you consider it because if you write down the acronym mm -hmm. and now you have to go back and explain what you've just written down, you've actually done more work than just writing down the acronym. And in many cases, the acronym is actually less efficient than just writing out essentially what it is. You don't have to write out the whole acronym, just write out, use real English as to what you're talking about. You don't have to say exactly. nor earlier than, just say won't launch before, not before, mm -hmm. right? It's super simple stuff. Anyhow, that is why we have our nap policy. There's an irony. In no, you that's that. that's why we nap. That's why we nap. Because <laughs> nap policy, I'm, I'm doubling up the policy. You are. That's I'm why we nap. We have a no acronym policy. And I think it's really good. Go back and reread uh, Elon's email. You get a better understanding of where he comes from. It's a slightly different place than where we come from mm -hmm. as to why he has a no acronym policy and why we have a no acronym policy. But I, I encourage you as an aerospace geek to adopt this same no acronym policy because I think it will help everyone. All right, I've harped on this. I think I've been on my uh, soapbox for a really long time and Space Mike looks bored in his preview screen. So we're going <laughs> to... I think he just winked at me. Uh, so <laughs> we're going to take a quick break. And when we come back... Comments. No. Oh, All right. No, no, no. Wait. No. Mike's got something Mike, to say. Mike did one of these. I, I, What's what? Mike say? I, yeah. I, I did just want to say one thing. I really wish that NASA would uh, name a lot of their probes and spacecrafts and missions like they did in the old days. All of their names had, you know, cool, interesting names. And yeah, they might have used the numbering system. Like there was a whole bunch of explorer missions and pioneer missions and voyagers and all of these. But at least they had a cool name to it. Nowadays, the only NASA missions that have cool names are the really big flagship missions. You know, Curiosity. New Horizons, Dawn, but then there are all these others that are crazy acronyms and it's just, it's awful. And I feel like there might even be some sort of lack of creativity to have that because how many times in the past five years can you guys think of that NASA has put out a call to be like, hey, elementary school kids or regular people, please name our cool satellite. You know, so I just wish they would do it like in the old days and just have really cool names for stuff or use a uh, like a mission type, you know, explorer, pioneer, surveyor, whatever, and then just use the numbering system. So. What, what is it? It's like Osiris Rex or uh, something mm -hmm. like that. That's that's an entire... I have no idea what that stands for. Yeah, it's an entire acronym. Everything means something else. I think that was it. Mm -hmm. I mean, you just, you have no idea what you're talking about. You have no idea what they're talking about. And the worst part about those acronyms is that they're inside the NASA. So they're not even inside the aerospace. They're just, they're pure NASA. And I just, yeah. So... <laughs> Our movement, in addition to getting humans on the moon, getting humans on Mars, the third part of our movement, again, humans on moons, getting humans on Mars, is getting humans to stop using acronyms and coordinate universal time. All right, on that note, we're going to take a quick break, and when we come back, comments from our last week's show. Stay tuned. We'll be right back. I figured since we sit, sit, sat there awkwardly going into break, we could sit awkwardly coming out of break as well. We're good at awkward. Speaking of awkward, let's talk about our patrons. That's a terrible segue. They're not awkward. <laughs> They're not. Just we are. <laughs> Mike's going, no! <laughs> These are the people who have contributed. I don't remember. Uh, $2.50 or more to this specific episode. Uh, these are Patreon Plus subscribers that will get access to After Dark as soon as it's made available early. This week's topic is actually going to be Star Wars. We have a topic for After Dark because we have been watching Star Wars. It's going to be awesome. You're going to get a lot of interesting comments from both of us, I think. Uh, and Tim. And probably... Oh, we lost Mike. Uh, and probably Mike as well. Uh, and uh, uh, these are our Patreon Plus subscribers. But we've got even more. So we've got our patron subscribers for as little as one penny 
you get your name in the show. You get a few other perks as well because one penny shows that you know you care enough to actually go through the effort of signing up <laughs> and filling out your name and then getting the notices of like, hey, there's a new show. Uh, so thank you to every patron. Every single penny helps. We are a crowdfunded show. Thank you so far, much for making this happen. You can find out more information over at patreon.com slash T-M-R-O. All right, one of our side projects is Launch Library, and I think our first comment talks about that exact side project. So let's uh, head straight into that. All right. Uh, this is a comment that comes off of YouTube. This is from Kim Boondergaard. Boondergaard? Bon Boondergaard? Bon you always choose the ones with the umlaus. You're Everyone on YouTube, welcome. change your names to have umlaus in your name, and Ben will for sure choose your comment. There was another one that I actually had umlaus that I actually pulled out for time. Oh, yeah. well, hey, thanks for that. Mm -hmm. So Kim says, after some help from the Launch Library team, I think I now think the app is in a good state to be shown. I posted a thread on Reddit for more information. And the app he's talking about is a launch library based application showing you the upcoming launches, um, uh, upcoming missions and whatnot based on launchlibrary.net, which is a side project of tomorrow. It is a huge database of things uh, that are space related from a launch standpoint mm -hmm. a, and an API that developers can write code against. So if you go to that URL that was at the bottom, is a tiny URL, uh, you'll head on over that. It's a Windows 10 application, so if you've got a Windows 10 machine, you can run that application. Pretty freaking awesome. There are other applications out there as well. I think there's the T-minus application in the Android App Store. And if you've got an application that you're working on, email me, benjamin at tmro.tv, and uh, that was cool. And um, uh, we'll try to find a way to feature those on the website. I'm super excited to see that stuff. If you're an application developer, I'm, there are a few applications I'd love to see. I'd love to see a Google Calendar mm -hmm. use, right? So you can just add it to your GCal and just uh, or an iCal. Uh, so you can add it to Outlook or iCalendar and OS 10 or your you know whatever, so that it just automatically pops up. Um, an iOS application would be kind of cool. So the many different things that you can do using this data to create things that go, oh hey, this is where I can go to watch this launch and watch it live. So there you go, launch library, awesome stuff. All right, next up. This one also comes from YouTube. It's from Gabriel Ducharme, I believe. Uh, it says, that Wait But Why article is so awesome, and I've yet to listen to the podcast. The Wait But Why article from, I think it's Tim Urban, is a miniature novel. Yes. <laughs> it is long. It is a long, long read. Uh, Mike, did you read it? No. <laughs> Donna read it, though. Donna, you read it. I, I did. It was fantastic. Uh, both both the uh, SpaceX one and the Tesla one, they, yeah. they were both really, really good. Really, really long. Really good. He did months of research on these things, talking yeah. about not just what SpaceX is doing, but the more important why SpaceX is doing it. Exactly. I highly recommend it. And because I keep harping on it so long, they, he actually made a podcast of it that you mm -hmm. can download as well. Uh, so uh, I think it's three hours. Someone in the chat room, correct me. I think it's like a three-hour podcast. Something like uh, that. Of just the SpaceX article. So pretty long, but still absolutely worth it. Highly recommend it for any space geek out there. You understand what's going on and why it's going on. Just to give you an idea, I am the too long didn't read guy. And I read the whole thing and it was fantastic. Mm. Nice. <laughs> TLDR. Yep. Um, <laughs> <laughs> You're welcome, Internet. <laughs> Dutta's napping. Love it. <laughs> uh, next up. Also from YouTube, this one comes from U5KO. Oh, lo long time commenter. Yeah, oh yeah. Every yeah. <laughs> go U5KO. Also, this is when I first learned, YouTube supports transparent PNG um, user thumbnails, and we are honoring the transparency in the graphic as well. If nice. You look, if you look at his thumbnail. Yeah, cool, huh? Yes. Ner nerdy thing I realized for the first time in this. We've been doing this for eight seasons, and I just now got one that had transparency in it. Yay! <laughs> it says, important point on the food issue. You need to go to the moon if you want to test any off-world food systems which incorporates gravity, notably aquaponics. If you can make this work with no or little input on the moon, you're all set for grilled fish all over the solar system and beyond. Well, fish will kill me, so not for me. But, um... <laughs> That's mostly true. You, you can simulate gravity in space, and in fact, the Ronald Reagan slash International Space Station was supposed to have a centrifuge mm -hmm. that, was, uh, that was going to simulate gravity. Hmm. It, like, that was a huge portion of it, is simulating gravity up in space, nice. making sure that we could do that stuff, and that all got cut. But that doesn't mean that we can't do it in space. You don't have to go to the moon. The moon is a option mm -hmm. to do this, but not the only option to do this. We could 
create something, put it up in low Earth orbit, have it spinning around, creating uh, virtual gravity, essentially, and test and see what happens. And actually, that would serve two purposes. One, it would actually prove out that it does actually work in space, mm -hmm. uh, which would then allow you to use that for your mission, long duration mission to Mars, and hopefully help with um, reduced bone loss. Right. And two, it lets you deal with aquaponics and your food growth and everything else. Nice. So I actually think there's a bigger advantage to maybe grabbing a couple Bigelow stations, spinning them around and creating gra artificial gravity mm -hmm. and seeing what you can do with that as opposed to going to the moon. But it's not one or the other. We should do all of them. We should go to the moon. We should go to Mars. We should build really cool space stations. Not just one of them. Choose them all. That's my default answer. Don't pick one. Choose them all. All right. Next up. Also from YouTube, this one comes from Big John 697791. Yes. We always use GMT in the Army as well as Zulu Time and BST, British Army. What's the issue with time? Hmm. We should just <laughs> like totally label this particular show as Ben's Soapbox Issues. Ben's okay. <laughs> Ben's is that in our uh, chat room? Is that what we're calling the show? Or are we calling this one Ben's Soapbox Issues? All right. The reason we don't use GMT, GMT Greenwich Mean Time, mm -hmm. um, uh, BST British Standard Time, mm -hmm. and then Zulu Time are basically all the exact same thing. And they were, back in the railroad days, the mm -hmm. most accurate timing system that we generally had. Okay. And it was accurate, accurate-ish. Accurate However, -ish. as we start doing things that require multiple decimals of milliseconds of accuracy, uh -huh. Greenwich Mean Time no longer has that. So we've moved to coordinated universal time, which takes into account leap, leap seconds, which Greenwich Mean Time does not. Uh -huh. So if you actually think about Greenwich Mean Time, it is off by 14 seconds, exactly. So if you were to look at a watch set to GMT and look to a correctly calibrated coordinated universal time watch, mm -hmm. which is set to exactly what you think, like the time right now, right. the GMT, the Greenwich Mean Time watch will be um, slow by 14 seconds. I think I did that math right. Okay, I got right? you. So okay. Greenwich Mean Time is actually wrong if you if you consider it. So coordinated universal time replaces Greenwich Mean Time. People think they're interchangeable. They are technically not. So coordinated universal time gotcha. is what we should be using. Interesting other factoid, mm -hmm. GPS in the United States mm -hmm. was developed before coordinated universal time mm -hmm. and uses Greenwich Mean Time. So when you're doing your time calculation, you're doing it 14 seconds off and then your own personal device is adding the time back in for the leap seconds to compensate for the offset from GPS time. Huh. Yep. Neat thing, huh? I because did not Greenwich Mean Time is actually wrong. That's why we use coordinated universal time. That's why all space agencies use coordinated universal time. Mike, do you have? Did you want to add to my little rant? And whenever I tune in for a live launch for any time, usually my uh, internet's lag gets me right caught up back to GMT. So. <laughs> <laughs> That's great. That's great. <laughs> That's good. So anyhow, that is why we don't use uh, Greenwich Mean Time because it's wrong. Okay. Just wait till we start getting into really stuff, fun stuff like spacecraft event time. Ooh. Yeah. <laughs> right? Because time oh, dilation. Yeah. yeah, time dilation. So yep. Mm -hmm. Oh, right. I Move like that. Moving on. That's okay. a real thing. Spacecraft event time is a real, real time unit measure zone. Time zone? Would that be? That'd be a time zone, I guess. All right. Moving okay. on. All right, so this last one comes from, or sorry, second to last one comes from Reddit, uh, from The Gaming Scientist. It says, a great show this week. Every time you have cop sub on the show, I always seem to love it. That would be Copenhagen's Orbitals for you. Uh, probably <laughs> because I love the idea that they are non-profit and they are just a group of guys that love rocketry. I'm sure the girls as well. They make building rockets look easy. Uh, and we, we love Copenhagen Suborbitals as well. Uh, but, you know, it was actually brought up, there are tons of amateur rocketry organizations around the world and um, if you're interested in what Copenhagen Suborbitals is doing, there are a couple ways you can you can help out. One, uh, finances always help. But two, if you want to actually do it and you don't want to fly out to Copenhagen, um, you've probably got an ro amateur rocketry club around you that you can join. And that, that's a really good way to get your hands dirty and kind of learn uh, the basics about how rockets go up um, and why they do what they do. So hit the internet. I, I don't have an actual link for you, but hit the internet, search for Amateur Rocketry Club near, and then whatever city you're in, for example, Tomorrowland, and uh, there you go. So yeah, but we absolutely love the Copenhagen Suborbital team 
yeah. almost say guys, it's team, you're right. So team, I think what they're doing is freaking awesome and uh, Mini Stoge wants to be their uh, their test yeah. astronaut. She, I almost said pilot, but she's not gonna pilot anything. She's gonna really. sit there like this for like hours and yes. hours and she hours. Wants to be their Actually, test monkey. Yeah, but doing this on the uh, on the ship as as it rocks back and forth, back and forth for hours before launch. Yeah, yeah. So there you go. And all right, last one. Okay, uh, this one comes up from Twitter. This is from John. Picture. picture. Oh, pretty picture. Aww. If you look carefully at that picture, it says, uh, "Quote that is one small step for Lego, one giant leap for all Lego kind." Everyone yeah. had been complaining that we got rid of Lego Benny off the set. Well, <gasps> we sent him on a mission. Mission. And there you go. If you look in the middle of the picture, you can see Lego Benny at the International Space Station, floating outside the coop. Well, not outside the cupola. No, no. Floating inside, inside the, the cupola, cupola. Uh, at the International Space Station doing his Lego mission for one Lego kind. So there you go. I think that was a good use of Lego Benny. Yeah. It makes it sound like we sent Lego Benny up, which we didn't, but uh, I'm going gonna, I'm gonna to leave it at that. All right, that's our show for this week. Well, no, Mike, did you wave? Did you want more? Oh, no, I was just like, wait, you guys actually sent, like, your actual Lego? Right. Like, you guys <laughs> Wouldn't that be awesome? Did some wheeling and dealing at SpaceX and got it on a cargo mission oh, or yeah. something? Like, Wouldn't wow, that be cool? Blew my mind for a second. Yeah, no, we're going to say, uh, yeah, that's exactly what we did. Uh, somehow, <laughs> magically, we got uh, Lego Benny up there. Uh, no, not our Lego Benny, but um, actually, uh, Dada, can you go? Oh, nope, never mind. doesn't matter. It's not on your cam anyhow. All right, uh, that's our show for this week. <laughs> Everything is awesome. Everything yes. is awesome. I'll, I'll mention it after dark what that's about. Thank you so much for watching. After Dark is up next. If you're watching live, stay tuned. It'll be right here. Uh, if you're a Patreon Plus subscriber, that's available uh, as soon as it's uh, online. And for everyone else, it'll be available in about mm, four weeks or so. Thank you so much for watching. We'll see you next week.